Hey guys, I have great news. The social studies standards just passed. Well, the, the unpacking documents and the supporting documents just passed. What does that mean? Like passed in terms of when to implement them or just passed in general? Social studies standards passed several months ago, um, but there were some issues with the glossary, the strand maps, the crosswalks, and the K-5 unpacking documents. So at the board meeting in June, they did not pass and they were postponed to today. Right. Um, so Angie Molinex and I and Christy Day worked on rewriting the entire glossary like within four days because we had to get it to, we had to rewrite it and then get it to social studies, get it to the superintendent and then get it to ELA to verify everything in there was written correctly. And um, so the glossary passed, the crosswalks got rewritten, they passed, the strand maps were updated, they passed and the K-5 unpacking documents passed. So great news, super excited. That's, that's awesome. So are we gonna have video, not have video? Is everybody using, what are we doing? You will have, have your have video, video on. Um, the participants probably won't have their video on, but if everybody could have their video on, that would be fantastic. Okay. And then if you wanna answer a question, um, you can either like shoot it to me in the chat. Like if there's something that comes up that you wanna specifically talk about that wasn't on that original um, document that I sent you guys yesterday, just type it in the chat and I can ask you that question. Um, and if there's anything in particular that you want to answer, um, just unmute and, or, you know, you can also type in the chat to me that you want to answer a question or you want to add something if you're having trouble getting in. Um, and then I can actually call on you. Um, is there anything that anybody wanted to add that was not in that document that I gave you? Not me. Okay, fantastic. I am somebody. I am somebody. I was somebody when I came. I was somebody when I came. I'll be a better somebody when I leave. I'll I love better. using restorative practices and social emotional learning to make sure that my students are connecting their social needs with their learning needs. I use personalized education plans for each child in my classroom. One-on-one -on -one we conference and we discuss their behavioral needs and their learning needs. I need to know their data story. That's my job as a teacher. But I also need to know their life story. What are their experiences? And then I need to know their behavior story. How do they respond to those experiences? So using those three aspects of their lives, I'm able to personalize and make learning more impactful. In my classroom, we say you have to make five mistakes a day. How many mistakes are you making? I made two. I also believe that we must bring joy in learning joy, fun, activities, experiential learning. That's what true authentic learning is about. To a new teacher starting in this profession, I would say bring love. Let's start there. My favorite quote is that our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. It is our lightness and not our darkness that most frightens us. And to me, that quote means the things that really make us great are the things that scare us the most. And a lot of times my students I'll recognize in my class uh, when they have to do something like a solo or if they are asked to step into the light, they recognize it's a very scary and uncomfortable place to be. And as, as an educator, I feel that it's my job to show them that that's what they really fear is the greatness that's within them and to show them that they can be so much more than, than they even thought that they could achieve. When I was going through high school, the very classes that I'm currently teaching are the ones where I felt the most myself, where I felt the most natural and I felt where I belonged. When I was 17 years old sitting in my band room, um, my two goals were that I wanted to change the world and I wanted to change lives. I felt that teaching would be the only career that I could do both at the same time. 
And then as a teacher, I truly believe that that is our goal, is to show our students the gifts that they have and how they can use those gifts to change the world. My classroom is a classroom of kindergarten, first, second, and third grade adaptive students, students with high special needs, from the need to understand that communication is happening around them, to actually learning to read and do math and experience some real academic successes. I have some students who have been in the general ed classroom and also in the adaptive classroom. I need to provide the support for that teacher in the general ed classroom that will make my student successful there. So from bell to bell, we are working with them. We are talking with them. We are moving them ahead in gaining the skills that they need to have. I think we need to look at our students as the individuals with great value and great worth and the potential that they have. We need to look at them with wonder, wonder what it's going to be like for them. I wonder what their potential will be. I wonder what difference I can make in their life. I want to build strong children. That's our business, that's our calling, that really is our passion, and that really is our joy. I began my career not as a teacher, but as an intelligence officer in the Air Force. So I think that that model is pretty legit for how clouds really look, right? My, my, my <laughs> it looks good. I'm kind of the Miss Frizzle of the high school classroom because I, I just love to teach and I love to find cool ways for my kids to learn. But I also love to dive down deep into what they understand and find the places where they need some help. Yeah, so just come in and see me tomorrow morning and I'll help you out with that, okay? Every single kid in my classroom has the potential to be a rocket scientist. It's my responsibility to figure out how to get them there. When you have your AV blood and you add A and you add B, see what happens. Each one of my students is unique. Each one of my students is different. Each one of my students needs something a little bit different from me every day. I'm a firm believer that a growth mindset in classrooms is a very, very important thing to help our students truly be able to grow and have to maximize their potential. Growth mindset does not just refer to your students, it also refers to you. I spend quite a bit of time outside of school doing to try to make sure I have maximized everything I can possibly do to help every single one of my students be the absolute best that they can be when they leave my classroom. Nia, which means what? Purpose. purpose. What is your purpose? I know my purpose is teaching. I think through music education, you can explore so many different areas, history, math, science, and it can be the springboard for a, a student to find their purpose. I get to use my medium to integrate with other subject areas so students have a broader idea of how music serves culture. It's a snapshot in time and culture, and it's also a definition of the culture at the time. In music, every voice, every voice is heard, and it should be heard. If you mess up, it's okay. It's the not trying that's the failure. It teaches resilience, and I believe that students need to learn resilience and commitment. I want to leave a legacy of learning, and I believe that through the right techniques and best practices, education is a bootstrap. Maybe if I give them that bootstrap, they'll be able to wear those boots well and walk into the future into their purpose. I believe that education is a calling. I believe that education chose me. I did not choose it. As a young kid growing up in poverty, as a dyslexic kid, education was the thing that continued to raise me and change me and help me become who I am. It helps to make you. It doesn't define you. Oftentimes, there's a greatness in students that they're not aware of. We see it as educators, and it's our job to awaken and inspire the greatness that a student has. We educate the potential of a student because a student can learn. If they're inspired, they can learn and they will always blow us away by what they learn if they're inspired. I think education should be always personalized for children, finding out who kids are, where they come from. When you grow up on the streets of New York and without a father and you're exposed to all those things, and then you can still become successful. Find out their cultural background and help them understand their cultural background. And then use that platform to build education upon. That, to me, that's the way education ought to be done. I became a teacher to make a difference.
And so I want to inspire my students to also do the same. I am fortunate enough to teach at the same elementary school that I attended. So my fifth grade teacher that is just right next door from my classroom now was my inspiration. She made learning feel like it was just a gift. And that's when I saw like, I wanna also be able to do that for students. And I wanna be able to inspire kids to to love learning for their whole lives. And so Piney Creek is just a really special place. It's a community, it's a family, it's a great place to be. So is it comparing and contrasting those cars or is it just telling you about them? Okay, so what, a, what is it when we're just telling about something? Description. Description, see, you used all of your clues and you found it, great job. So if we can create a place here for them where they know that they can impact change and have voice, then we can use education to propel them forward in a way that they can stay here and improve our community or also feel like they can go out into the world and create change in other places. In order to make sure people understand who our students are, I need to say that we are an alternative school, but we are also a community school. Any student can come here who wants to, but some students are asked to come here because they simply cannot function in a regular classroom because their lives are far too difficult. I think it's also important that people know that those of us who are here are here because we choose to be. But at this point in my career, I want to work with students who are in most need of someone who is entirely passionate about them and who they are and what they can do for the world. And so that is what this school is about. It is about bringing in students who may not have another good place to go and making them feel welcome and making them feel comfortable and then saying, what can we do for you? How can I serve you? How can I allow you to give the world what you have to give? And once you've answered those questions, then you can do things like we've done with the grants where you provide coffee because so many of our students don't get sleep because they're in situations where either they don't have a bed or the family is too noisy or there are people coming and going all night, so they don't sleep, so they come in and they're tired. And they sometimes come in hungry, so we give them food. So we personalize by taking care of their physical needs. And I think that this school is a place where so many people's passion meets the world's great need. Students have the capability to learn. They have a natural curiosity for learning. I just have to find what that is. I have to build that relationship with my students. That relationship is what makes that student develop confidence in themselves to know that they can be successful. It's my job and my desire to find out what motivates each one of my students, to remind them that learning can be fun and engaging and interesting. And I want them each day when they spend that hour in my classroom to come in excited about whatever we're gonna do today, to go home talking about it, to remember that once upon a time they really loved learning. I want them to enjoy their learning process and become partners in it with me. You knew number sense that that's yeah. not possible Possible, so you were able to go back and fix it. That's good, you caught the mistake, good job. I want them working toward personal growth. They have so many abilities. So often I need to provide the spark, I need to capture the interest, and maybe provide a little bit of the framework, and then I need to get out of their way because what they can create and what they can develop together is really quite incredible. And I am amazed every year at what they're able to do. I believe that collaboration is the key to student success. I believe that education truly can be the way that everyone has the best opportunities in life. I believe that all children have the capability to learn and to be excited about learning. I believe as educators, we are built to champion our students. I believe that our students are the future. I believe in the potential of every single student. All students can learn. I believe that the public school classroom is the last bastion of democracy. I believe we have to inspire potential, we have to educate greatness, and we have to love our students in the meantime. So good morning. We hope you are enjoying the VT Summit thus far. It's been a great, this is the second half of the day or the 
day two and so far things are going really well for us so next we would like to welcome the 2020 Burroughs Welcome Fund Teacher of the Year Mrs. Maureen Stover I'm going to start calling you Mrs. Fizzle so Maureen you will be our facilitator for today's panel Maureen has with her several members of her cohort with her today and she is going to introduce them so I'm going to pass it on over to you Maureen and we will begin our lunch and learn session Thank you so much, Tina. And good morning, and thank you all for joining us for the Lunch and Learn panel with the 2020 Burroughs Welcome Fund North Carolina Teachers of the Year team. I am Maureen Stover, and as the 2020 Burroughs Welcome Fund North Carolina Teacher of the Year and a 2021 National Teacher of the Year finalist, it is truly my honor to lead a discussion with this extraordinary group of educators. The teachers who are joining us for today's panel are fierce advocates for the 1.5 million students and the 100,000 teachers who are the heart of North Carolina's public schools. Together, they make up a team of teachers who represent all eight educational regions and the charter schools in our state. From the mountains to the sea, they seek out opportunities to transform education through actionable solutions. It is my honor to introduce each of these educators who you will learn from today. Beginning with the mountains, we have our 2020 Burroughs Welcome Fund Northwest Region Teacher of the Year, Maggie Murphy, who is an elementary school teacher at Piney Creek Elementary in Allegheny County. As we move toward the central part of our state, we are joined by three educators. Tanya Smith, the 2020 Piedmont, Region, Piedmont Triad Region Teacher of the Year, is a vocal arts teacher at Elkin Middle and High Schools in Elkin City. The 2020 North Central Teacher of the Year, Carol Forrest, is an elementary adapted curriculum teacher at Long Mill Elementary in Franklin County. And rounding out the central part of the state is the 2020 Burroughs Welcome Fund North Carolina Charter Schools Teacher of the Year, Ashley Bailey. Ashley is a science teacher at Roxborough Community School in Roxborough, North Carolina. As we move toward the sea, we have our final panelist, the 2020 Southeast Region Teacher of the Year, Daniel Scott. Daniel is the band director and music teacher at Swansboro High School in Onslow County. We would love for today's session to be interactive. So if there is a question that you would like to ask, or if you have any comments, please be sure to use the chat and I will be monitoring the chat throughout today's discussion and sending those questions to our panelists. So, over the past 15 months, teachers have faced challenges like nothing that we have faced before. The pandemic shifted the way we teach and pushed us to new levels as educators. This year, every teacher was a beginning teacher. So I'd like to ask our panelists if you could each share something that you learned about yourself as an educator over the past year and tell us how you use this to improve your teaching practice. And we will start with our uh, Northwest Teacher of the Year, Maggie Murphy. Okay, well, it looks like maybe Maggie had to step away for a second. So I'm gonna go ahead and throw that question to Tanya Smith to start us off with the discussion. Hello, so, so much have I learned. I think that, um, I felt like a beginning teacher, so I feel like I am a kindred spirit with anybody who's a beginning teacher and watching right now the the technology piece, the teaching music online. I know Daniel can um, echo that struggle, but I think the thing that I learned the most about myself, you know, prior to the pandemic, in music classes, we focused so much. Yes, we made connections with our students. And yes, that's very important. We like that family atmosphere because they become your family. But it really is um, more about connection and not perfection. Those lessons aren't always going to go perfectly. And that piece that you're working on is not always going to sound beautiful because trust me on Zoom, it's cacophony. And then you figure all those things out. And so you have to give yourself, um, you've heard this term a lot, but you give yourself grace and you and you give your students grace and you let them try over and over. So it's more about, to me, it was more about less of a grading policy and more of, can you try that again? Can you improve it as you go along? Can you 
um, make it better by just giving a little more energy to it and then take pride in your product rather than in the perfection of a product or a 100 on a, on a, a just check it off, I got that done. It's more about the progress and the connection with the students and not the perfection of the process, so. Thanks, Tanya. Um, Carol, did you have any perspectives that you wanted to add? I actually really do have something that I would like to add. I think our attitude informs our practice. And for me, it was all about the attitude which I approached the virtual learning. And I think our attitude also not only informs our practice, but our attitude also infects others. It's like COVID. Our, if we have a positive attitude, it is going to affect those around us. And um, I was a brand new learner in so many regards to technology this year as well. But it was, what do we always put in our mission statements and our vision statements? If you've ever been in that school building that they have created their new vision or mission statement, we want to be lifelong learners. We want to grow lifelong learners. So we have to be willing to be lifelong learners. And I honestly think that the pandemic and learning to do school virtually and really affect learning for children helped us become exactly what we want our students to become. And that's a lifelong learner. Awesome. Thanks so much for that perspective. Ashley, what about you? What did you learn this year? so many things um definitely i felt like we all came in this year suddenly on the same uh on the same plane together and we realized that we all needed each other we realized that we truly are stronger together it did not matter how many years of experience you had if someone had a great idea tip trick way to fix things hey let's share it let's work together and that was an awesome thing to see uh, that we really could could value everyone's skills in terms of our students, I thought that our, our kids saw us really as as human this year, you know, that uh, we were trying new things. I can't I can't tell you how many times I told my students, guys, I, I've never tried this before. <laughs> we're going to see how this goes. And, and to what Tanya said about uh, the progress being what's important and the, the journey to get there, not so much what that final grade was. It was an awesome opportunity to really tell that to our students and practice that and let them see that. I was saying, you know what, we're in this together, we're gonna try this together and what we're doing along the way, whether it was building relationships or learning together, that was the most important thing, not necessarily that that end product, um, that place we were trying to, to get to. Um, but I just, um, we were all asking this year, how can I best reach my students and what is the most impactful way to deliver my content to them and experience this together? And uh, there are things that, that came out of this year that I'm going to absolutely keep going forward. So that's a positive. Awesome. Thanks. And Daniel, what about you? Hi, everyone. I'm super excited to be here. And, you know, it's interesting because all it, like ending the conversation after all these amazing teachers, I, I don't really have <laughs> too much to add because uh, I, I agree with everything that everyone has said. One of the things that I recognize is through uh, the most uh, barriers, sometimes is where magic can exist if you look for it. And I, I think that one of the things that I learned a lot about myself, I knew I was a resilient person, but resilience through and, and having to be innovative while you while you're also going through the most trauma that we've ever experienced in an entire as an entire society has has sparked a lot more resilience in me um, but through that i had to actually put a post-it note like in my desk drawer that said if you give up they win like literally each day i had to look at that post-it note and just remind myself 
why I'm doing this. And they could have been whoever you chose for that day. It could be uh, administrators. It could have been the COVID. It could have been like whatever it might have been. They was a different person each day. But I had to remind myself every single day about why I was doing this and why we were going through um, all this trauma and making sure that we were still looking for the magic and the silver linings within the barriers that existed in front of us. And so resilience is one of those things. But the other thing I picked up, which I kind of uh, started to listen to some mentors about, which uh, is the saying, it's everything that happens in your classroom is a reflection of something you did or did not do. And so tying back to what Carol was talking about, if you had a, in a culture of negativity or a culture of pessimism, that was due in fact to your reflection of how you interacted with the experience. And that's the same thing with if your students succeed, you can be really excited and pat yourself on the back because that's your fault. But if there's something in your classroom that you don't like, you can look at yourself in the mirror and say, oh my gosh, that's also my fault. And that's one of the things that I really learned as an educator was the way that I interacted with the situation was exactly what happened in my classroom. And so it gives you a lot more control in that, but it's based off of how you respond to the situation 100%. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you guys all so much for those perspectives and for sharing all those great insights. One of the things that teachers learn throughout their careers is that things in our classroom rarely go as planned. For anyone who logged on for my opening session yesterday, you saw an action when a technology glitch meant that I presented by phone instead of through WebEx. Can you guys all share with us a time that something did not go as planned in your classroom and explain how you shifted that challenge? to a learning experience and a growth opportunity. And we will start again with Tanya for that question. Oh, so many things. <laughs> okay, so I think one that just really pops in my mind right now is um, when we first started the whole process of screen share. And um, so I was trying to share my screen and I was on plan B, you know, the plan B, which was the hybrid. So I had students in the classroom and I had students at home and I could not get the sound to marry with the screen share. So I had all my kids at home, like typing in the chat. We can't hear you. We can't hear you. We can't hear you. Or the kids at school going, you got to do this. You got to do this. So I think that the best thing I did was tell one of my techie students, please just come do this. Will you be the teacher for about five minutes? And so I learned things from my students and then they, they begin to feel really even more valuable than before, because, you know, I needed them as much as they needed me. And you talk about bonding with people, you bond when you need each other like that. So that was something that I learned. And that does not mean that it didn't happen a second, third, maybe 10th or 11th time. <laughs> But you work through those things. I think that's what I, I remember what Daniel said about being resilient or actually about we need each other or Carol, your at attitude, you know, all of the things that you've said, you just apply that and you make it a funny moment rather than a panic moment, you know, and it teaches your kids how to respond to those mistakes or those actions. So I don't know if that made sense, but there's that. No, that made perfect sense. And thanks so much for sharing that. Um, so Maggie Murphy has been able to join us. She was having some uh, surprise, surprise, right? In the world of COVID and all the, the online things we've been doing. Um, she was having some technology issues, but she's been able to connect with us now. So Mags, we're just talking about a time that something did not go to plan in your classroom and how you shifted that from uh, something that didn't go right to an opportunity to grow and as a silver lining. So if you wanted to think about that and then uh, I'll go ahead and go to Ashley next so I don't put you on the spot right away. Okay, you are, all right, so I'll go ahead, <laughs> go ahead and talk. Um, so I, I'm laughing thinking about how many things didn't go right. I mean, I think 
more things went wrong than went right, especially in the beginning. And how many times we'd run out into the hallway and say, did Zoom crash for you too? Because it's not working for me. Um, texting kids on remind and saying, um, folks at home, just hang out. I'm coming back, you know, we'll, we'll figure it out. Um, so th it happened all the time. But I, I love that when Daniel mentioned resiliency, I was thinking about this prior to this panel. And I feel like we always talk about teachers and students being resilient and how this year really demonstrated that. But I feel like it showed me how to do that in small ways, how to be that way every single day and, and not just, you know, as a as a whole year type of thing, because from class period to class period, I mean, just because it worked first period doesn't mean it worked second period and trying to just reach into my brain and go, OK, what is the main what is the most important thing that I have to accomplish today? Maybe all these tiny little things that I had planned to do are not going to work right now. Maybe they'll be working in 15 minutes, but they're not working right now. So what is the most important thing that I need to do for my students today? And how can I do that quickly and effectively for everybody? I also had kids in front of me and kids at home. Um, and so on a daily basis, it was just kind of reaching into that bag and saying, all right, <laughs> you know, we're going to throw out what the plan was and figure out what I can do. And, and it was OK, um, because again, uh, it showed those students that we're going to make this work. I remember very distinctly telling my students when they were feeling very frustrated about technology issues. We were doing group work. The sound was not working well. We were doing breakout rooms and they were just frustrated, you know, which I understood. And, and I told them example of our uh, 2020 team and I said, you know what? We've been working together all year and we've only met in person maybe two or three times and we're working on all this really important stuff and if we can do it you can too and they just kind of nodded like okay yeah you're right we can do this so being able to go through that with them and share my experiences and and use that as a teaching moment was really valuable awesome thanks ashley carol what about you well for me one of the really most important things that we had to do is just embrace the humor of the moment. Because if we did not embrace the humor of the moment, then we really could just get super discouraged. So I teach adaptive curriculum students. My children on my screen, when we were all virtual, were five-year-olds, six-year-olds, seven-year-olds, and an eight-year-old. And um, if they did not have a parent or a Mimi or a Nana right next to them, then many times I would be looking at nine blank screens. They would be gone. They were gone. And so I, all I could do is pull out my magic glasses and say, oh, I'm looking to see if I can find Logan. Where's Logan? Where's Logan? So when he heard his name, he would come back to me and I could keep on teaching. <laughs> So honestly, I had to embrace humor. I had to embrace humor every day. I also have two incredible instructional assistants. And I hope many of you as beginning teachers are lucky enough to work with a team member. And those instructional uh, assistants were invaluable. We all were on, we were all logged on. And whatever I was teaching, they were illustrating. They were doing the assignment that the students were supposed to be doing, whether it was clapping their hands, doing hand motions, writing something on a whiteboard, whatever it was. They were amazing. And so for me, having those assistants who could just read the moment, they could go along with me and find their magic glasses when we were looking for our missing students with with our we had one person on screen and nine blanks. Um, that was wonderful. So I think you have to just you, we just had to embrace the humor, enjoy the moment, enjoy our students, and um, work together. Such awesome perspective, Carol. Thanks for sharing that. Daniel, did you have anything you wanted to add? Oh yeah, I mean, so the first 10 weeks of school for us were actually outdoors. Um, we were not uh, allowed to have or make music indoors. And they said, you could either figure out how to create your curriculum over again and redo everything and have no performance driven opportunities within your class, or you can go outside. And I remember being the most frustrated <laughs> that I had ever been when I was told that I had to be outdoors uh, for 10 weeks straight in rain and wind and sun and hail 
it's North Carolina, y'all. So like getting tornadoes, there was all of these different weather patterns that existed that we were outside for. And I just remember this one time that uh, we were under this tunnel. So we had an awning, but it was, wasn't much space. So all the kids were kind of in straight line, six feet apart underneath this, uh, this tunnel spot. And I uh, like went really far back so I could hear the entire ensemble because they were spread out over 90 feet uh, in that situation. So I was real. I was in the sun. The kids were in the shade. I said thank you. Uh, they said thank you for that. But I was conducting them, and I recognized like how cool of a setup this actually looked like, and that we could probably figure out a way to do a performance in this area specifically. And that's when I like my my wheel started to turn. As soon as that happened, a gigantic gust of wind came and picked up every single kid's music stand and threw it fifty. And so there was like the Swansboro band track uh, team who was running after all of their music. And so that those are just some of the things that from that situation, there was both beauty and there was also like pain within that situation because all the kids had to chase. And like Carol said, I just had to laugh. There was literally nothing else that you could do except for laugh about what was going on in that situation and just kind of say, you know what? at this moment it is what it is we're making music we're doing what what the kids love to do but from that situation when i recognized that we could still have an ensemble that they sounded good in that setup that the kids were resilient we actually ended up having a fall concert in october after being outside for 10 weeks straight learning all of this music we had an outdoor concert that we uh, did under tents in the exact same setup. We put Christmas lights underneath the tents uh, to provide lighting for the students. And then we had an FM transmitter that we transmitted the concert to the parents who were sitting in their cars like a drive-in theater. And that was one of the coolest experiences I've ever had. And you know, when we really think about you know, what we're teaching our students through all of the tribulations and trials that we had as teachers, that resilience translated over to our students. And I think we learned a lot about how our kids can adapt and overcome to every situation, as long as you as the adult in the room are willing to do the exact same thing. And the kids will, will raise to those expectations that you set in front of them. And, you know, that memory of having a drive-in concert outdoors during a pandemic underneath Christmas lights is something that we will never forget. I don't wanna do it again, but like, I will never forget it. And I'll, I'm really excited that we had that opportunity to share that uh, lesson of resilience to our students. Our kids will never get a better lesson in resilience as of this last year. I love that, Daniel, such great perspective and such a great way to take something that looked like it was gonna be a problem and turn it into a huge opportunity for your kids. Maggie, did you have anything you wanted to add? Yeah, so I'll just say hello really quickly and just echo everything um, that my my panelists have said too. I think it's just so important that our kids know that we can do it since we're asking them to do it, that they that they know that even though we don't can't always predict what's going to happen or that we have to be flexible, that it's just so valuable for them to learn that at a young age because sometimes that they're even better at it than we are, uh, right? But um, it's been such a wonderful year of of all the silver linings, even through all of the difficulties and all of the things that were really, truly challenging. It helped me grow as a teacher. It helped our class grow together and just the relationships we built and how much more important they were this year than ever before and how we can carry that forward. Um, I think the parent piece was super important too. I talked to parents a lot more than I have any other year and just made sure that we were a true partnership. All of those things, I think just, um, you know, made our year successful, even though we had the opportunity for it to, to not be a success at times. Absolutely. And like you said, those relationships were key. They've always been key, but this year we really saw just how important they are to our ability to truly educate our children and to be partners with their adults and helping them get the best educational opportunities available. We had a couple of things in the chat that I wanted to highlight. Um, one is from Caitlin, and she said that the motto for 2020 was, bear with me, I've never tried this before. And I think that would be true for all of us, that there was a lot of experimentation and a lot of trying new things that we had never done before, but finding the best solutions to all those challenges we face to help our kids. Um, we also had a comment from Reagan. She said, I had one that was a virtual performance for graduation and everything was crashing. The internet would not work and Zoom went out and it wouldn't come back up. However, the students knew the song so well that they continued to sing with no music. 
and it was a music teacher's nightmare. So I'm sure that Tanya and Daniel can both really, really uh, appreciate that. Um, but I think it also shows the resilience of Reagan to find a way to still make that happen and to have given her students the tools to be successful, even when they were facing a challenge. Um, we also had another comment from Caitlin where she said, I did a hybrid format for my students teaching this past semester. My supervising teacher was a huge help with the online kids while I was teaching in a class in uh, on Google Meet. Um, and I think that's really important because I had a student teacher last spring when we went into remote learning initially. And, you know, I'm old. So like me trying to figure out new computer stuff was not very intuitive. And I really kind of struggled with in the beginning. And my student teacher was the one who stepped forward and said, I know about this app. Let's try this. We can reach the kids using this. We can do instruction doing this. And I was like, oh my goodness, who is the mentor teacher here? And that was a really great reminder that our student teachers, beginning teachers and pre-service teachers have so much ability to truly step forward and be teacher leaders in your first few years in education, embrace those opportunities. You are an important part of the educator team that we have supporting all of the students in our schools. And without our pre-service and beginning teachers, we're not a full team and we don't have all the tools that we need. So never be afraid to step forward with your ideas or perspectives or to give some advice to somebody, even if they're an old teacher like me, we appreciate that advice. So thank you so much for, um, for bringing that up, Caitlin. That was very, very helpful to remind us of that. So we've heard a lot about relationships from many of our panelists and how important those are. And we know that forming those relationships are key to our students' ability to thrive in our classrooms. Can you share some of the best practices to form authentic relationships with your students? And we'll go back to Tanya for that one. So I've always been very close to my students. I think that's just inherently a music thing. I Maybe I'm wrong, but I just feel that, especially with music, you really form those relationships. But if for the first time ever, you know, I didn't have students in front of me when we first started in, in Plan C in my county. And my students were traumatized. They they literally did not know how to communicate. It, it was, you know, they you would think they would because of all the texting that they do, but they didn't. They were on screen. It felt awkward. No one would talk. No, nobody wanted their camera on. And there was the whole debate of cameras on, cameras off, all that stuff. So. Once we figured all of that out, I started doing something called a question of the day that had absolutely nothing to do with music. Absolutely nothing. It had more to do about feelings or thoughts or opinions or whatever SEL question I could come up with for that day. And the more that we did it, and I'm keeping this by the way, forever. For the rest of my teaching career, I will do a question of the day as their bell ringer. Um, they started to open up about things and feel safe with each other and respond. Sometimes they do it in a private comment and then we would share it if they allowed it. Or sometimes they would just talk about it. Yes, it took some time away from music content. Uh, 10 to 15 minutes, uh, it would take away. It was the best 10 to 15 minutes of a class ever have I spent was, was doing that with my students. And, you know, one of the questions was, if you could um, tell me three things you would like for me to know about you right now with without judgment, what would they be? And you wouldn't believe how they opened up. So. That's just a practice that I used that I will continue. You know, and it had nothing to do with music content. So there's that. Yeah, Tanya, I think that's really important. And thanks so much for sharing that. Ashley, what about you? Did you have anything you wanted to add there? Sure. Um, goodness, just love them, y'all. Just um, they are not going to be lovable every single day. <laughs> um, but, but just love them. They, my advice is, is talk to them, get to know them as more 
than the person they are in your classroom. There is so much more to that student than what they are, what they show you when they're in your room for however much amount of time that might be. Um, and sometimes you really do have to make an effort. There are those children that will tell you their whole life story on day one. Uh, and then there are those students that like Tanya said, it might take time and trust uh, to get through to them and to, to reach them in maybe a different way. Um, I know that you are, are very busy as all teachers are, but if you can get involved with them in something outside of your classroom, that is always a wonderful opportunity, whether it's um, you know lunchtime or a club or something like that, a field trip opportunity. When you see them in a different way, um, it just opens up those conversations and builds those relationships. I recently had the opportunity to attend a retirement celebration for a wonderful teacher that had taught for 45 years. Um, and the kids made videos for her and what they all commented on, they said things about her class, but what they said to her was, thank you for showing up. Thank you for coming to my recital. Thank you for coming to my ball game. Thank you for, and it's not that you can, can you know, take all of your time to do all that for all your children, but those little things are what they remember and it's what's special to them. And I promise you, you may not reach them all right away, but don't give up on your kids. Um, keep trying, keep pushing. Um, I recently saw uh, just this week, one of my students um, that took my class twice because he didn't pass it the first time. And I tell you through that whole first year, his head was down, he didn't talk, he didn't want to communicate with me, but we kept working at it. And when I saw him, he's graduated. And when I saw him this week, I was able to give him a big hug and he had a big smile on his face. And we have that relationship now. Um, it's not always gonna be easy, but it is so worth it. I love that, Ashley. It isn't always easy, but it is always worth it. Thank you so much. Carol, what about you? Did you have anything you'd like to add about forming those relationships? Oh, you know I do. <laughs> so remember, I teach five and six and seven-year-old children. And for me, that is the most natural thing in the world to absolutely love those kids. So for me, forming those relationships with the children is not a problem. They love me and I love them. They know that they are safe with me and they know they belong to me and we belong to each other. And so that is the really easy part for me. But what is the really most important part for me is to form those same relationships with their parents. Because parents with children with special needs are on a journey that I don't really understand completely. And their journey is so completely different than what they anticipated most often. They did not anticipate a journey of doctor's offices and hospitals and surgeries and no communication. You know, they did not anticipate what's happening to them. And so I want them to know that I am on their team and I am going to do everything that I can to help their children learn and grow. But the most important thing for them to know is that their children are loved in my classroom and they are safe in my classroom. And um, I can't tell you how much that means to parents. In fact, I am going to be moving to a little bit of a different position next year. And so I am leaving my kids that I would have all of them again next year. And as I let my parents know, I had many parents text me or email me and say, I am heartbroken because they know that we make a really great team for their kids. I just want to say one more thing about making that team. I think you've already heard me say how important our attitude is and how it infects the people around us. Um, I think that we are the architect of our environment. We get to create where we work and we create it not only for ourselves and for our students, but we create it for the people that we work with as well. And being the architect of my environment, I want to of course, I'm one of those teachers that's taught for 45 years. I started teaching in 1977 when none of you were thought of probably the beginning of teachers. But um, I love creating an environment where young teachers love to come into my classroom. And I have a whole bunch of young mamas and, and young teachers who come into my classroom every morning. And um, I want to be the place where they know that they can come and say something, hear something, be somewhere where they're going to go back to their classroom and be a better teacher that year. I have just, if I could, if you would just indulge me to read just a little, I have this sweet, sweet letter from a speech therapist that I work with. And this is to me why it's so important to create all the relationships that we have in the building. She wrote this to me as we were celebrating my last day at my school last this year. And um, it's just five quick little thoughts. 
And this is what we need to be having in the back of our mind. This is what a kind of teacher I want to be. This is what she wrote to me. When you thought I wasn't looking, I watched you advocate for children and families that needed your voice and could not advocate for themselves in order to ensure your class received the best education possible. When you thought I wasn't looking, I watched you speak with genuine kindness and love, even if we knew you may be disappointed or even angry. When I, you thought I wasn't looking, I watched you care for your students like Caleb, and I learned how important it is to slow down and first to make sure a student felt secure and loved. When you thought I wasn't looking, I watched you read the same book again and again, a little better than the last time, with even more enthusiasm, and wondered to keep every student on the edge of their seat. When you thought I wasn't looking, I saw you calmly plan for virtual learning and watched your determination as we all learned something new. Those are just some of those little thoughts that she shared, but you, we have to know that we are being watched and um, we do affect the people around us. And so what we, what we get to affect is all up to us. And so forming those relationships, super important, just do it. Carol, thank you so much for also reminding us of how important it is to form those relationships with our coworkers and with the other people that work in our schools. You're exactly right. We, we are constantly working with people to be that team to support our kids and being the architect of our own environment truly enables us to form that team and have those relationships that can truly support each of our students and help them reach their maximum potential. So thank you so much for reminding us for that. Daniel, what would you like to add about relationships? Uh, the thing that I would have to add uh, to all of these great things that have been said is that we are not teaching content, we are teaching people. So how can you bring the people within the content that you teach every day? Um, I think it's really important for us to not forget that all of our students, every single student has a specific culture within their own houses, within their own families, that we must ensure that are being seen every single day. Um, the American education system is, is really great at teaching one culture specifically. The Anglo-Saxon culture, we all know that. But it's not really great at bringing in culture of every facet of our country and of our great state. And so we have to ensure that if we're building true relationships, it's not just about asking a kid what they like to read. It's not just about asking them what their favorite music is. It's about truly digging deep into who they are as people and making sure that they are seen within your content. I think that is essential to what we're doing. And I think COVID-19 helped us slow down, stop running the rat race that we've been running for so long and focus on the individuals that are in our classroom every single day. Uh, it gave me that opportunity through music to make sure that every single one of my students saw themselves within an artist, a musician, a composer, and that every culture was represented within my classroom. I think that that's essential uh, for all of us to do. Now it's, it's easier said than done for different classes and different subjects, but that's our job. That's our goal is to teach the people the content and not the content to the people. So that's, that's kind of what I have to say about relationships. Daniel, thank you so much for reminding us of how important it is that we are using those culturally responsive teaching practices as educators and remember that we are teaching people. Um, I love your perspective on that. And I always think of my classroom as a patchwork quilt. And each piece of a patchwork quilt is a piece of fabric that has its own story and has its own history, but it's an important part to the total pattern. And if we're missing any of those beautiful pieces of fabric, then we're missing out on the beauty of the quilt. And I think the same thing when I'm teaching my kids. Each of my kids has a unique story and unique experiences and a unique history. And it's in my job to figure out ways to capture them and to include them into that beautiful pattern that makes up our classroom culture. And so thank you so much for helping us remember how important that is as we're forming relationships with our students. And Maggie, did you have anything that you would like to add? Yeah, I'll piggyback a little bit on, on what you and Daniel said, especially here at the end, um, just about we try to create a family in our classroom and we use uh, global education a lot to do that so that we are accepting of, of all cultures and we want to tell all the stories and we want everyone to see themselves in all the literature and so we really try to be um, just 
you know, just that welcoming place in our in our room that makes everyone feel that they're welcome and that they're family and that we're all in it together. And I think that helps build the relationship between myself and my students. And then when they um, relay that back home to parents that we all feel like we're connected and we all, you know, every time I address the parents, I talk about us as a family and it's just um, something that I've become more aware of as I've, you know, been teaching for several years about how it's so important that they feel included in the decisions as well. So we just try to build that um, that family piece in so that we're all connected in a way that allows us to have those relationships and and know that we're giving each child what they need, um, no matter where they come from, so that we're equitably, you know, forming that group in our classroom. Yes, exactly, Maggie. Thank you so much. Um, we did have one question that came up in the chat that I just wanted to throw out there to our panel, see if anyone has any perspective. Um, so we, Caitlin asked if there are any summits or conferences that are like this one that would be coming up in the near future that would focus on integration of newer technology into classrooms. Um, I do know that many of our school districts and this at the state level offer professional developments that you're able to sign up for that would be specifically targeted at doing um, in, incorporating more technology into your classroom. And then you can always look for other opportunities like through Google for Education, Apple for Education, and other um, industry partners that are looking for ways to include technology into our educational systems. But I also wanted to offer that up to the panelists to see if anyone had anything else that they would like to add. I was gonna say that um, we've had a lot of success with uh, using each other as as PD opportunities and sharing ideas and within our building. And I don't know if that's something you know that you're able to do at your school um, or maybe within several schools. Um, I know our district here does that as well, um, uh, district wide, not just school wide. But saying, hey, who is an expert in what type of technology and who feels comfortable sharing that with other people? And that's really valuable because these are people that are using it on a day-to-day -day basis and they're able to um, you know, share what they're doing right there in the moment. Um, and that can be really, really valuable and helpful. And it's specific to maybe your needs as a school, which is also helpful. Um, and all these awesome things I'm seeing in the chat too, um, I second NCAT, go to anything they have. <laughs> Yes, we all vote for NCAT. If you ever have a if you ever have a chance to go, it's all time favorite places. Just the communities that are built there is amazing too. As you know, in addition to what you learn, um, I also threw a couple of things in the chat about um, Appalachian State is doing an idea con in July. Um, and if you follow me on social media, I can get you hooked up with that if you want to. And then participate learning is the global program we use that also offers so much PD, not only uh, technology and how to incorporate that, um, especially globally, but um, all the things. So we would be super happy to invite y'all to all of those. And just the more we learn, you know, the better that we can do together. And it's so fun to have each other to lean on, like Ashley said. Well, we only have a couple of minutes left for our panel today, so I just wanted to check to see if there's anything else that any of our panelists would like to add as advice or tips or tricks or anything that you wanted to say to our beginning teachers. Hang in there. You know, you've got what it takes. You've got what it takes to, like Maggie just said, love first, teach second, make it about the kids. If you make it about the kids, it will 100% benefit you. You will be impacted way more and you will feel so purposeful. And that just will energize your classroom. Just make it about the kids. That's the first and foremost, and always remember, always, always remember equity isn't equal. Always remember that because it will help you. Yes, Maggie, you have the ability to change the world. Absolutely. I'm going to be quiet now. <laughs> I think I think what we have to recognize in this profession, this beautiful profession that you've decided to get involved with is that you are the first and last defense for many of our kids. Um, for for much of what we do in the world, 
you are the one if you are a beginning teacher in the early educational field who can first start them with creating this empathy, this compassion, this love for community and for 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 uh, everyone within the community. And then if you are a high school teacher like myself, then you are that last defense before they go out into the world to change the world for the good or bad. And so you have to recognize that that we are truly the first and last defense career. Um, and we are the ones who are the change makers. So congratulations for being a part of this field. You have a badge of honor, but also a yoke of responsibility uh, to do really well by these students in our in our state. Wow, thank you guys all so much for sharing those perspectives. And thank you so much to this extraordinary team of educators for sharing your thoughts, ideas, and expertise with us today. I wanna to say a huge thanks to all of our beginning teachers for joining us for this lunch and learn session. The 2020 Teachers of the Year team is so excited for you as you enter the dynamic career field of education. And we cannot wait to hear about all of your successes as you continue into your career. So thank you so much for our panelists and for all of our participants for being here today. And thank you so much to our incredible REF team for inviting us to be part of the panel and to have the opportunity to speak to our beginning teachers. The REF team just wants to thank you all. And you guys, this was amazing. I heard so many great points today. Um, I'm taking notes over here. And I think we all learned this year that we are truly stronger than we probably ever gave ourselves credit for and definitely stronger together. Um, Daniel, I have my post-it note too, but I think I'm gonna make another post-it note because maybe I need you know, to, to brighten that up a little bit. Um, I'm gonna go find some magic glasses, Carol, because I probably need some of those too. But, and Ashley, yes, and Tanya and Maggie and, and, and Maureen, yes, just love those babies, just love them. Um, and we can't give up on any of them and we definitely can't give up on ourselves. So I would like to just say a big thank you to you guys just for being with us today. You are all amazing. Um, your insight was just greatly appreciated. So for everyone else, please remember to join us back today at 3 p.m. for the 2020 Wells Fargo Principal of the Year, Keisha Clemens, and she's going to give us some closing remarks. And we hope that you all enjoy your sessions and um, just Yes, have a great rest of the day and we'll see you back at three. Thanks again, Maureen, for just hosting this and just being Maureen. <laughs> Absolutely. It was my pleasure. Thanks for inviting us to be part of the BT Summit. It was a lot of fun. Absolutely. I appreciate it. Absolutely. Enjoy your summer and you guys take care.